Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you as a group of women and opening your word and seeing what you have to say to us. Lord, teach us tonight what you want to teach us. Lord, instruct us that we may live the calling that you've called us with, Lord. Father, help us to embrace it as a glorious calling. Holy Spirit, give us a, a love for the job you've given us to do here on earth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Alyssa is a 15-year-old girl who recently told her parents that she is really a boy. In a clearly rehearsed speech, she tells them that she's always felt out of place in her body. And so this year, she started going by Aiden at school. She's using he, him pronouns, and recently she started binding her breasts when she leaves the house. And now she's ready for the next step. She wants to see a doctor so she can begin to medically transition to being a boy. Now, distressed, her parents quickly make an appointment with a family counselor who can help them know how to help their daughter. In counseling, Alyssa explains that she's always felt like an outsider at school because she walks with a limp and she doesn't quite fit in. And then puberty came along and made everything worse. In middle school, the boys used to make fun of her because she was a late bloomer. In ninth grade, when she started to bloom, the boys started saying different things. It was a darker tone. Instead of being an object of their ridicule, now she was an object of their lust, and it was scary. And then one day, a boy cornered her in the back of a classroom and groped her. This left her feeling dirty and vulnerable. She began to hide her growing breasts under baggy clothing, wishing that she could just get rid of these parts that drew attention. Alyssa told her counselor that although she didn't have many friends at school, she had a very welcoming home in an online community she had found, in the fan fiction pages for the Percy Jackson series. While reading this series a few years ago, she had come across a gender-fluid character named Alex Fierro, who switched back and forth between pronouns, male and female. She was immediately intrigued. So, curious, she searched online for all the fan fiction she could find about Alex Fierro. This eventually led her to TikTok, where she started looking up videos tagged gender fluid. She discovered there, instead, a treasure trove of accounts of girls who were transitioning to boys. There were so many of them, and they all said the same things she had been feeling. The same feeling of not belonging, the same unhappiness with their bodies. She devoured video after video of girls going through transition, getting top surgery and showing off their newly flat chests. They didn't have to wear shirts anymore. Giving themselves their weekly tea shots, their testosterone shots. And her eyes drank up the changes that this brought, their deepening voices, their more defined muscles, the way that the, the fat on their bodies was melting away and leaving these hard, sinewy bodies in its place, the higher energy they had and that feeling of aggression and euphoria, all of this from testosterone, this was like a magic shot. And all these girls, now boys, seemed so happy. It didn't take long for the counselor to diagnose Alyssa with gender dysphoria and affirm her decision to pursue transition. Her parents were horrified. This is not why they had taken her to counseling. They started asking questions. What about her fertility? Oh yeah, she says she doesn't wanna be a mother now, but, but what if later on she wants to have children? What, what if she came to regret cutting off her breasts someday? 15 year olds don't know what they want. She can't get them back once she's done that. They'd read online about the dangers of cross-sex hormones, how women who take testosterone will start to have atrophy in their vaginal walls and of their female organs, an atrophy that will cause constant pain just walking around, that will make impossible any future pleasure in sex, and that will lead to a hysterectomy at an early age. This information was not readily available. They had to really hunt for it. So many of these decisions were so permanent, and, and Alyssa was still so young. She was so changeable still, so impressionable. The counselor listened patiently to their concerns and then informed them, 
Aiden's teachers are on board. Aiden's friends are on board. It's time for Aaron's par Aiden's parents to get on board too. If they stood in his way, they would likely push Aiden to suicide, and the counselor could not allow that. So while it is preferable that parents be involved in the process, if they were found to be insufficiently supportive, she would have to take over Aiden's case herself and work with a doctor to help him start down the road to transition. Now, I wish I could say that I made up this story. In reality, this is a composite of a few young girls that I know personally, some of them very close to me, all of them girls who have parents who love the Lord. What in the world is going on here? Everywhere we turn, we are being told that gender is no longer tied to your body. We're being told that men who pose as women are women and that they should now have full access to our bathrooms, our sports teams, our women's shelters, our gyms, and there's no room for debate. If you disagree, you are a transphobe. If you ask questions, you are doing violence to these trans people and their very existence. Now in the past, gender dysphoria was characterized as a mental disorder, and by past, I mean until 2013. It was something that usually started in early childhood, and then 90% of them outgrew it by the time they reached puberty, but some of them had continued um, feelings of gender dysphoria, unhappiness in their own gender and their own body. What we have today, though, is something completely new, where we have waves of adolescents, 80% of them are girls, who suddenly, out of the blue, announce that they are not comfortable in their bodies and they have never felt like girls. This is brand new. This is not something that's ever existed. The other thing that's brand new is that now we have an entire society rising up to accept, embrace, and coerce acceptance of this new truth. This sudden onset gender dysphoria often happens in clumps, in groups of teenage girls doing it together. Studies show that two-thirds of these girls have another separate mental health diagnosis. Studies show that many of them have experienced some sort of trauma in their life already, some sort of abuse in many cases. A highly disproportionate number of them are on the spectrum. So these are troubled young girls who are experiencing genuine suffering. They are unhappy girls. They feel like they don't fit in. They feel like there's something wrong with them. So they go online or they go to their friend group and what they learn is the problem is that you're in the wrong body. Now, I know these topics are confusing by design. They're confusing and they're uncomfortable. And I know that a lot of us might feel like this isn't really relevant to us, but it is. It is affecting people who grew up in our church. It's affecting our children our grandchildren, and if not them, certainly their friends at school. Today's teenage girls are more unhappy than they've ever been before. A report came out just this February, and it showed that one in three high school girls seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year alone. One in three high school girls. The same studies showed that 57% of them, more than half, report feeling persistently sad and hopeless over the past year alone. Ladies, the kids, and especially the girls, are not all right. They're suffering. They are in the bullseye of Satan's target today. Now, this is not a time when we can sit on the sidelines and pray that our pastors figure these things out. If this is a problem that's hitting our girls, then as women, this is our job. Titus 2 tells us that older women are to teach younger women everything that's involved in living a life pleasing to the Lord. So as our girls are struggling to understand what it means to be a woman and struggling to want to, we're the ones who have to help them. We call these gatherings Women Equipping Women. And tonight is going to be a true equipping session. So usually what we do is we take... Um, a passage of scripture, and we walk through it real carefully and just teach all the way through it. Tonight is something a little different. We're going to go to the first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 through 3, and we're going to come to this with a question. What is a woman? What does it mean to be a woman? 
And we're going to pick out some different ways that the first three chapters of Genesis answer that question. My prayer is that by talking about these things together, we can become more aware of what's going on, more clear on what scripture says, and more prepared to welcome and help these sufferers. So let's start by asking Genesis chapter 1, what does it mean to be a woman? So if you have your Bible or Bible app on your phone, go ahead and open to Genesis 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So in this account, we have our first definition, which is not on the board. I'll just tell it to you. First definition, number one, a woman is a female image bearer of God. A woman is a female image bearer of God. Now, what we hear over and over today in the world is there is no such thing as a gender binary. There are not just two genders. There's a spectrum. There's many genders. There's 70-something genders on different forms you can fill out. But this passage, this creation passage, tells us there actually are two. And not only that, creation is full of binaries. So already, just in chapter 1, we have seen that when God made things, in many cases, he made two of them that are different from each other. So he made darkness and he made light. He made the waters and he made the sky. He made day and he made night. He made morning and he made evening. He made the land and he made the sea. He made the sun and he made the moon. He made male and he made female. Binaries all the way through. And God didn't create two genders on accident. This was not a fluke of creation. It wasn't just because. He created two genders very much on purpose because this was how he wanted to display his image to creation. He chose to express his image in the binary of male and female. So every single person ever created is created as a sexed being. Either you're a male image bearer of God or you're a female image bearer of God. And the two of them are different, and that is an essential feature of our identity. We reflect God differently as male and female. So as image bearers, both men and women get to be God's representatives to all of creation. And that means that we're like him in a way that no other creature is. So that when the angels and spirit beings look at us, they see reflections of God in an important way. Imaging him also means that we have an assignment. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, two things here. Number one, be fruitful. That means be like God in making more image bearers of God. Be fruitful. Now, that was going to require males and females to know who they were, to accept who they were, and to find each other. Okay? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It also meant they were to have dominion. That means they were to stand in God's place and rule over the creation that he had made. So what was Adam's first job in the garden? God told him to categorize and name all the different animals. And that's a reflection of the way that when God created, he separated and he named things. Right? So Adam and Eve were to be like God in the way that they ruled over the world that he had created. Now, as image bearers of God, men and women have equal worth and equal value. But that does not mean that they're identical. Think about this. The members of the Trinity are the same in substance, equal in power and glory, right? As the old formulation goes. But they are still three persons. And they still have three different identities. The Father is not the Son and cannot be the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit and cannot be the Holy Spirit. They are separate. And like them, we are equal to each other, but we have different identities. Identities that are fixed. Identities that are not interchangeable. We're to reflect him in those identities. 
So the biggest problem with transgenderism is not that it's messing up women's sports, although it is. The biggest problem with transgenderism is that someone like Alyssa is being taught to deny the image of God in her. She is actually denying an aspect of the image of God. So from Genesis 1, a woman is a female image bearer of God. So Genesis 1 is like a big, a big picture, like overview of creation. And then in Genesis 2, we, we zoom in on day 6, and he retells the story in a slightly different way of how he made man and woman. Genesis 2.18 There we are. That's where we are. Is the only place where God says that something was wrong with his creation. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Skip down to 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay, so in this text, we see that a woman has a body designed to gestate life. So after looking at every single animal that God had made, all the different kinds, Adam now wakes up from his sleep, looks at this new person and sees, she is like me in very important ways. And also, remember, she's naked. She is not like me in very important ways. He saw that she had a body that was going to enable her to carry out a different role than his did. She had a body that was going to allow her to be a mother by gestating new life. He would quickly realize he had a body that was going to allow him to be a father and implant new life. Those were different. Her form told her what she was. Her body revealed her identity. This does mean that the gender distinction is biological. Our sex is encoded in our bodies. Almost every cell of your body, if you take out the red blood cells, pretty much every other cell of your body is either male or female. It either has XX or XY chromosomes. That means that 27 trillion parts of you say woman. This XX genotype then expresses itself in the phenotype, which is the different body parts that we can see and be aware of and study. And they're going to either look male or female. So that's what Adam was able to see when he looked at his wife. So in a woman's case, she's going to have a body organized around the potentiality of gestating life. That means she's going to have the ovaries to make the eggs, and she's going to have the uterus where a baby can grow, and she's going to have the breasts that can then feed the baby. This doesn't mean that in every single person this always works out and, and develops perfectly, right? We live in a fallen world. But in Eve's case, certainly, her characteristics would visually define her as a woman. Now, there are obviously some women also who, for a variety of reasons, will never be pregnant. Either they can't be, they don't marry, they choose not to, whatever it is. Does that make them not a woman? Well, Eve was declared to be a woman before she'd ever had a baby, right? 100% woman from the moment she was made. In the same way, you were a woman the moment you were made. Because the moment a baby is conceived, that baby is already XX or XY already male or female. And by, you know, midway through a pregnancy, whenever you go and have that ultrasound, those XX and XY chromosomes have already shown themselves in a fully developed reproductive system in a baby. By the time you see that ultrasound, that baby already has all the parts that it's going to need to have his or her own babies. It's pretty amazing. When we look at that ultrasound, we can look and say, hey, look, there it is. It's a boy. And when we do that, we are not assigning a gender to that baby. All that we're doing is looking visually and recognizing, acknowledging the truth of what God has already done in them. So as we grow, in spite of being clothed, we should still be able to look at one another and know whether we're male or female. Every human society in just common grace wisdom 
has had different conventions for how women dress and how they do their hair and how they present themselves and how men dress and do their hair and present themselves, right? And this is not the same across societies. There's not one prescribed way that God has said women have to dress like this and men like this. But everyone figures out, every society, how to dress the men and how to dress the women so that they can look at each other and figure out we can make a baby or no, we can't. We should be able to do this. The difference is important. And scripture forbids impersonating the opposite gender. Old Testament and new. Deuteronomy 22.5. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. It is a sin to try to pass as the opposite sex. Because when we do that, we are again denying who God created us to be. In the New Testament, God repeats this in a command to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's a bit of a confusing um, chapter. We'll teach on it someday. But the point of it is women are to dress and look like women. Now, just to be clear, when a man decides that he wants to be a woman and he declares that he is a woman, and he pursues all the things that he can do to look like a woman. What he's essentially doing is an elaborate impersonation of a woman. He can take the hormones that give him a higher voice and softer curves and less muscle. He can get breast implants. He can wear makeup and he can put on clothes and act in a feminine way. But all of these changes are only cosmetic. There are things that will trick the eye into saying, this is a woman. Saying so doesn't make it so. Because he can never make even one of those 27 trillion cells in his body that are all XY say XX. He can never get a female reproductive system. His entire body from conception has been organized around the male reproductive role. It can never be reorganized to gestate life. He can never be a woman. So Genesis 1 and 2 show us that a woman is a female image bearer of God whose body is organized around the gestation of life. And also in Genesis 2, we see that a woman has a role that's both beautiful and glorious. Look back at Genesis 2.18 again. Then the Lord God said, here it is again, the not good. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So the first woman was created to image God as a helper to the first man. So before we get all bothered about the idea that we're just little helpers, right? Like that means little servants or little slaves or less thans. Let's consider what that word is. Azer, I think is how you say it in Hebrew. Helper. It's used 21 times in the Old Testament. Okay? And of those, two of them are right here in this passage. The woman is a helper. Three of them are talking about an um, allied army for Israel, and the other 16 times are always used to describe God himself in terms of what he does for his people. So when a woman is told that she was made, Eve was made to be a helper, she is being called to image God himself, who is the helper to the ones he loves. She's being called to do what he does, use her strength to meet the needs of someone else, to come to his aid. Remember, it was not good, it was not complete, it was not whole when man was alone. We fill in the gaps. How do we do this? Well, first, the woman is a helper in multiplying and filling the earth. Okay, Adam was made from dirt, Eve came out of Adam, but every single other person who's ever lived has come out of the body of a woman, right? There's no multiplying and there's no filling the earth apart from the woman doing her role. Because of our bodies, we're the ones who give birth and then we're the ones who continue to be close to our children in order to feed them and nurture them after they're born. And this job goes on for a long time. Long after we're done feeding them, women tend to stay very close to their children because humans are very, very slow to mature. Like if you look at the animal kingdom, 
I mean, you got giraffes, like they're dumped out when they're born. They like stand up and start walking. Not so with humans, right? It takes like two decades to get a finished product. (laughs) And this is not an accident because we're not just teaching them how to get food and how to survive. We are training image bearers of God. It takes those two decades to teach them who God is, what his ways are like, what he's done for us, what he calls us to be, how we can reflect that to the world. That is primarily done by women, always has been. George Washington said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am, I owe to my mother. I attribute my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. Quotes like this are legion. Because across human history, mothers are the ones who have been closest to their children. And it's interesting also across human history when a mother has to leave her child when she dies or when she goes to work or when she's separated from her children for some reason, this role is almost always filled by other women. Grandmothers, big sisters, babysitters, nurses, nannies. Women are the nurturing sex. And this is not a fluke. This is not a defect of capitalism. This is not a facet of the patriarchy. This is the design and plan of God. We are helpers in raising children. Second, women have a beautiful and glorious role within marriage. We get to be the wives, not the husbands. That means we get to respectfully submit to our husbands while they lovingly, sacrificially lead us. These roles weren't invented by men who want to keep us down. They were invented by God, who intended marriage to be a picture of his own relationship to his people. Whether in the Old Testament to his people Israel, he was the husband to Israel, or in the New Testament, where Christ has a bride, the church. We get to play a part in showing the world how God's people relate to him. These roles are not interchangeable. Third, women have a beautiful and glorious role as helpers within the church. Now, it's true that scripture reserves a few roles just for men. So the office of elder is only to be held by men. And the practice of teaching the word of God with authority to men in the context of a gathered assembly, it's very specific, is reserved for just men. That's why we don't have a bunch of men sitting in here. But other than that, women are not only permitted, but called to serve in just about every other way, using our strength to build the body of Christ. And this brings us to a really, really important truth that I'm going to take a minute to flush out. So we have to be really careful about not baptizing our own cultural gender stereotypes. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, God made us with a ton of diversity. So... There's a wide range of behaviors and personalities that can be male, and there's a wide range of behaviors and personalities that can be female. Every culture has its stereotypical, like its stereotypical roles for men and women, but not all of us fit into those stereotypes. Not all boys are gonna be daring and brash, and not all girls are gonna wanna play with dolls and talk about their feelings. And we have to make sure that our stereotypes are big enough, broad enough, so that we're not pushing a tomboyish girl to wonder whether she's really a boy, especially in this day and age. It's, these stereotypes don't come from nowhere. They're not just invented wholesale. They're rooted in truth. So a baby boy has a little Y chromosome that wreaks havoc in the womb. Right around eight weeks of gestation, he gets his first testosterone bath. And this causes little boy parts to start to form. That happens pretty quickly. And then in the second half of pregnancy, he gets another testosterone bath. And that wave severs a bunch of the neural connections in his brain. Mm -hmm. And it changes the way his brain works. That's why boys tend to have more lateralized brains, which is a really good way of saying, nice way of saying that the two hemispheres operate independently of each other. So these... Changes result in differences that are observable right from the start. 
by three months of age, so this is way before we can blame it on culture, there's already measurable differences between the sexes. Baby boys tend to be more active by three months old, and they tend to have better gross motor coordination. It's like big movements. And infant girls at three months old have better vision, hearing, eyesight, memory, smell, touch, fine motor skills. <laughs> Baby boys focus on objects. Baby girls are more responsive to the human face, to the human voice. Baby girls at three months old already cry more in response to other infants' cries. By the time they reach three years old, boys tend to be better at visual spatial integration, puzzles, mental rotation of objects, hand-eye coordination, and navigation and directions. Yes, it is true. <laughs> Little girls tend to be better at talking, <laughs> listening, and reading expression on human faces. They have a higher emotional IQ. But the important thing to remember here is that these differences are aggregates. These are averages. This is if you study tons and tons of little baby boys and little baby girls. Here's how the averages break down, okay? Within that, within those averages, there's a whole spectrum of how they're wired. Within each gender, there are going to be individuals who don't fit the stereotypes. And God made them that way. He made them to be outliers. And that is good. So we have to be really careful not to define what is appropriate for each gender more narrowly than God does. Not to put up limits and restrictions that he hasn't put up. So what can this look like in the church? Well, in the Old Testament, interestingly, we have women. We have women who are warriors. We have women who are teachers. We have women who prophesy women who advise and correct foolish husbands, women who kill enemy soldiers, women who feed the hungry, women who influence kings, women who work in the fields, women who run businesses. And then in the New Testament, we see women who are disciples. We see women overseeing charities, women financing Jesus's ministry, women hosting churches in their homes, women who believe and speak the truth even before men do. And in all of these things, they're not criticized, they're commended. Doing all of these things didn't make them less feminine, and it certainly didn't make them less female. On the other hand, we have prominent men who play the harp, write poetry, weep openly, dance in the streets, and are very effusive about their love for their male friends. There's a very broad range of behaviors that are feminine and a very broad range of behaviors that are masculine, and there's a ton of overlap because here's the thing, both men and women are made in the image of God. There's so many things that we have in common. Boys can play sports and so can girls. Men and women can both like action movies and men and women can both hate Hallmark movies. There is so much room to use all our gifts, pursue all our interests, whether it's cooking, remodeling houses, or roping cattle. All of these we can do without disobeying his commands or going beyond the limits he's given us. And this is extra important for us to remember in this day and age. So a woman is a female image bearer of God. A woman's body is organized around the gestation of life. She's called to a role that is beautiful and glorious. But women are also sinners who need a savior. And this is where we come to the sad part of our story. Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What was the serpent's strategy here? Number one, get Eve to question God's word. Did God really say? And then step two, tell her a lie. You will surely not die. Step three, 
offer her something better. You can be like God. He follows the same playbook today. It always starts with questioning the reality of God's word. Did God really say there are only two genders? How do you know that sometimes he doesn't switch things up, that sometimes mistakes aren't made? Then, a lie. Your body is not the real you. The real you is who you are inside. If who you are in here doesn't match who you are out there, then you aren't a woman. Finally, a better offer. You are not bound by your body. You can choose your own gender and be whatever you want. Now, we've often observed that what we're arguing over is the very existence of truth, the very ob existence of objective reality. Is there a truth outside of us, or do we each get to construct our own truth, our own reality? And this shouldn't surprise us, because Satan has always been about twisting the truth. Any way he can dig the sand out from under the truth, he's going to take. The transgender lie did not come out of nowhere. It's the offspring of the Enlightenment, of Romanticism, of existentialism, postmodernism, and a little bit of cultural Marxism in this very recent day. Its roots go back hundreds of years, but really, its roots go back thousands of years to the garden, to Satan's fundamental lie, did God really say? Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, up until this point, everything in creation has been whole. Every relationship has been right. There's this radical openness, this nakedness before each other, this intimacy, this mutual love, just like a reflection of the relationships in heaven. But in this account of the fall, we, say, we see these cascading layers after layer of, of alienation and brokenness. We see that God is alienated from us. He's now angry with us for our sin. We see that we are alienated from God. We don't trust him anymore. We're afraid of him. We hide from him. We see that we're alienated from ourselves. We feel guilty because of what we've done. We're alienated from our own bodies. Suddenly we're ashamed of them. We're alienated from each other. We blame each other. Now we're fighting for power and control. We're alienated from the rest of creation, which is going to resist our rule. It could be said that the key feature of creation was wholeness. But the key feature of the fall is brokenness. The world is now under a curse, and even the best parts of life are not as good as they were made to be. The truth is, we all know that there's something wrong with us. We all know that we're not who we should be. We're not what we were made to be. And this is troubling. It's troubling, troubling enough to drive us to despair. And just like Adam and Eve, we tend to blame this brokenness on anyone but ourselves. It's the patriarchy. It's my parents' fault. It's God's fault. He made me this way. But even as we say that, we know from an early age, and certainly by adolescence, that there is something wrong, not just out there, but there's something wrong in here. Alienation from ourselves, alienation from our own bodies. Now, when I was an angsty teenager in the 90s, this alienation took the form of anorexia. 
as we were growing up, a ton of developing young girls mistakenly looked at our emerging feminine curves and thought, ew, disgusting. I don't look like the boys, I'm too fat. And the cultural script of our day said the way to feel better about that was by starving ourselves or sticking our fingers down our throats. The difference is, back then, all the responsible adults in our lives were telling us that this was not true. All of the responsible adults told us our curves were beautiful, that we needed that extra fat so that someday we would be able to nourish children. I thank God for every woman and most especially my own mother, who told me again and again and again that I looked exactly as I should. The difference is today, the responsible adults in teen girls' lives are doing just the opposite. When these girls say they hate their bodies, when they say they don't feel like they're really girls, the adults in their lives are applauding them and saying, you're right. Here, let me show you what a breast binder is. Yeah, it might deform you, but you'll feel better. Here are some puberty blockers. Yes, they might hollow out your bones in irreversible ways, but it'll make you feel better. Here, cross-sex hormones. They'll give you all those feelings of euphoria and make you look like a boy. They'll also sterilize you for life, but you'll feel better. Here, you can have surgery to cut off these breasts and be done with them forever, and you'll feel better. I can't imagine what my life would have been like if the responsible adults around me had heard me say, I am too fat, and responded, yes, you are. Here are some laxatives. Let me show you how to restrict calories even more. I'll teach you how to vomit after your meals, and I won't tell your parents. If the adults in my life had spoken with the voice of the snake, these young girls, they're not wrong when they think that there's something broken about them. There is. But the problem isn't their bodies. The problem is that their sin is separating them from the God who made them. All their misery, all their lostness is rooted in that. It's in him that we live and move and have our being. And when we're separated from him, from the truth of the God who made us, we don't know who we are or what we're for. But this is the message we have for the world. This is the promise of Genesis 3.15. This is the very first preaching of the gospel. God promises Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. One day, a man would be born of a woman and he would crush the head of Satan, our enemy, and he would cover our sins and he would heal our brokenness and he would restore us to God. That man was Jesus Christ. He saw our misery, and although he was God, he left his Father's side in heaven, a place of bliss and harmony and peace, and he entered our world instead, our fallen, broken, alienated world. Jesus took on a body so that he could suffer as we suffer, so he could weep real tears at the death of a friend, so he could be exhausted after a long day of work, so he could be vulnerable in a hostile crowd. Ultimately, he took on a body so that he could die for us. And he didn't have to do this, but he did. As Isaiah puts it, he bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we are healed. Your biggest problem is not your body, and it's not the systems of oppression around you, and it's not even the trauma that you've suffered even though that might be great. Your biggest problem is your own sin against God. But Jesus died so that we could be forgiven of that sin, so we could be brought back to God. He's the only one who can fix what's wrong with us. Now, in our church, we highly value women doing the work of Titus II, right? The work of evangelizing and discipling and counseling other women. And as I see it, we have two big jobs to do in relation to tonight's topic. First, we need to teach our own young girls that it is a blessing and a joy to be made a woman. Sigmund Freud said 100 years ago that women are intrinsically envious of male biology. 
I used to laugh at that quote. Now I look around and I see it's coming true. A lot of young women want to have the bodies of men. What we need to tell them is we are embodied creatures, soul and body made as one, and our bodies, our female bodies, are part of what God called very good. We will still have bodies in heaven, and every indication is that they will still be gendered bodies. Jesus rose from the dead as a male, and you will still be a woman in heaven. And in some ways, it is harder to be a woman, right? We're the weaker sex. It's just true. Think back to what it was like to go through female puberty, okay? So like one year, you're able to run and play with the boys. You're just as big and strong and agile as they are. You can wear a swimsuit without any embarrassment. A year later, suddenly you're putting on weight in weird places, and you have these things that get in the way of playing sports, and suddenly you have to wear special apparatus to take care of these things, and everything looks weird on me, and I'm getting all this creepy attention from grown men my dad's age, and it scares me, and it makes me want to hide my body. This is where we need women's voices speaking to them and saying, you are beautiful. These things that are happening to you that seem scary, yeah, they kind of are, but it's a process that's going to lead to beauty. This is good. When your daughter gets her first period, do something with her to celebrate because her body now has the ability to create life. Those curves, when your daughter starts getting these curves, God made those curves and he said they're good. We should teach our girls it's totally okay for our bodies to get soft while our brother's bodies get hard. It's totally okay for us to dress up those bodies, to want to shop for pretty clothes or to put on makeup or to learn how to fix our hair. And it's also totally okay not to. It's totally okay to prefer a natural look. They're both feminine. Look, God just made us, he made us the more beautiful sex. It's just a fact, okay? We should embrace that and love that and teach our daughters this is good. Both men and women delight in female beauty. We should delight in our daughter's beauty openly. Being a woman is a privilege. We get to be more openly emotional than men and nobody's gonna call us a sissy. We can build deeper relationships with our friends than men and it's not considered weird. We get to marry men, that's a perk. Our lives are more cyclical, and there's a certain comfort in that rhythm for us. And we have within us the superpower that we get to grow babies. I am a huge fan of everything we can do to build the sisterhood of young women. Tea parties, I love our third through sixth grade girls Sunday school class. Like, they're pre-adolescent, and they already have, like, special tea parties together. And these things that the boys enviously are like, oh, man, our class just sits. That is great. We need to have all the things we can. Girls' nights out, spa nights, anything that we can to teach our girls to love the fact that God made them women, that he chose for them to be a girl and not a boy. Our second Titus 2 job is to welcome the sexually broken. It is impossible for the sexual revolution to lead to human flourishing. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. And we see that all around us. That means that there are going to be women who have played the Tinder game of casual sex. And they feel hollowed out and empty. There are going to be women who have pursued homosexual relationships and now realize that they're sinful and disordered. There are going to be women, like Alyssa, who have pursued transition to who knows what degree and now she has deep regrets and in many cases, permanently altered bodies. I've often prayed and I still do pray that the Lord will lead these women to us, to his people. And I pray that when he does, when we see someone who looks like maybe they've had this kind of confusion in their past, that our first response is not, but our first response is compassion. Because we need to remember what started them on this whole journey in the first place was suffering. Real suffering. And somewhere along the way, they were deceived into thinking that this was the way to relieve that suffering. But in being deceived, that doesn't make them different from us. 
that actually makes him just like us. We've all been deceived by sin. So may we welcome them in with open arms and say, join us. Tell me your story. Help me understand the path you've walked. Let me weep with you over your sorrows. Then let me introduce you to our God. Let's pray. Lord, my prayer is very simple for this group of women. Lord, bring us to those of us who know you and love you and praise your name. Bring us these broken women so that we can bring them to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.